Welcome to the Beast Rider Podcast. I am your host, Ryan Sakamoto, and today we're going to be discussing the Twitter exchange between me and defensive tackle Javon Kinlaw. That's right, me and defensive tackle Javon Kinlaw had a little Twitter exchange. It was short-lived as Javon Kinlaw later deleted the tweet, and I'll go into details on that later in this podcast, but let's go ahead and talk about defensive tackle Javon Kinlaw, who is a first-round pick, drafted number 14th overall by the San Francisco 49ers in a trade-down scenario, where they also picked up a fourth-round pick in return. And as a result, through the first 12 games of the season, Javon Kinlaw has been struggling up to this point. All right? So, Javon Kinlaw, apparently, I've been on his list, I guess you would say, of quote-unquote Uh, doubters for I don't know how long the tweet that I'm about to reiterate that he wrote on his social media outlets and requoting me and then calling me his biggest inspiration all right so let's get down to that he says you're my biggest inspiration I think about you every single day I'm gonna show you who I am and what I'm about slowly but surely this ain't no sprint it's a marathon they ain't build Roman in one year Okay, that was in response to my tweet where I said, let me pull this up here. I said, looking back at my Twitter timeline and people thought defensive tackle Javon Kinlaw was going to be a freak while trying to throw shade at my analysis for saying losing Buckner was huge, which it was. We see it now. And Kinlaw would struggle, which is true. We see it now. Those same people are nowhere to be found. I call it how I see it. He then responds with the tweet I just mentioned, and then I respond back to him saying, I take this as a compliment. As I stated in my podcast, you have Pro Bowl potential. Best of luck. Check my YouTube and Twitter receipts. I said that since day one, that he's a proverbial boomer bust prospect. You're going to get a player who's going to be considered a Pro Bowl, all pro type player, or you're going to get some type of a bust. And that's what we've seen with Javon Kinlaw. Why do I say that? Well, I included in an All my podcasts, especially in the one that I'm doing, I include earlier podcasts so you guys can connect the dots, so you guys can keep track and up to date on my analysis, on my YouTube receipts, on my Twitter receipts, so that way you can kind of gauge what I was thinking before things happen. Everything's in hindsight, but when you predict things before it happens, that's where you gain credibility. That's how I gain my credibility and gain 240,000 fans on social media and so forth. All right, so let's go ahead and get started and talk about Javon Kinlaw. Coming out of the draft, again, the descriptions in the podcast of an of an, of, a, of a podcast, an earlier podcast, I should say, and why I thought he was a proverbial Burma bus prospect, and I'll just touch base on that a little bit here. What I saw from Javon Kinlaw at South Carolina was a player who showed flashes of all pro potential. Okay, he would get to the quarterback. He has a violent hand. He displays a nasty mean streak. He hustles. That's something that qualities that all coaches can covet, as well as he is a strong bull rusher. Now, what Kinlaw lacks in discipline, he makes up for it in flash plays and based on God-given athletic ability. And when you get by in college just by pure athleticism and pure freakish ability, that doesn't necessarily translate to the NFL because, as we know, games are won down in the trenches, and if you don't play with sound technique, giving up outside leverage, giving up containment, I guess you would say, at the point of attack, things like that, not being the lower man, getting out leveraged, playing with a high pad level, these are things that I've seen from Javon Kinlaw out South Carolina that has translated into the NFL up to this point. Now, to his defense, he is a rookie. Okay. I will go into details why I'm saying all these things. And again, this is not a shot at Javon Kinlaw. I, again, I believe Javon Kinlaw can be a Pro Bowl player. I don't see anyone else putting that out there. I believe Javon Kinlaw can be a Pro Bowl player. But at this stage in his career, it's not panning out. And I don't expect him to be a Pro Bowl year in his rookie year, but the trajectory the trajectory that he should be on should be on that Pro Bowl level scale. And I'm going to go into it and break it down brick by brick as to how he fares up. Not to Buckner. Okay, that's unfair. I'm not going to compare it to Buckner. Let's compare it to other rookies, which I also included in an earlier podcast I wrote on Raekwon Davis of the Miami Dolphins. All right, 
But getting back to the Twitter exchange, let's talk about that. He says, I'm his biggest inspiration. He thinks about me every single day. Well, that's bad. That's bad. You should be thinking about your next opponent. He should be thinking about his film work. He should be thinking about practice on how to get better with his leveraging technique. He's more focused on me. That's flattering. But why me? Why me and the NFL media are you having the need to just come at me when I'm actually giving you praise, calling you a Pro Bowl player, and just citing what I saw before you were even drafted? These are predictions where people were coming at me, oh man, no, it's okay, man, it makes sense, man, we could lose to Forrest Buckner and we'll be okay because we have John Kayla. No, that's not how it works. That's not how this game works. Potentially, he has the all-pro potential or Pro Bowl potential. Realistically, you can't expect that from Javon Kinlar this early in stages of his career. You just can't. It doesn't make zero sense. All right? But again, it goes back to why me. ESPN Nick Wagner wrote on November 25th that he was struggling as well. The only difference is I called it out before he was drafted. And this is what Nick Wagner said. He said, Kinlar has just one and a half sacks, which didn't come until week 10, and he struggled... Miley against double teams, winning his rush on four of 76 pass rush, pass rush reps against multiple blockers. Even when he's seen one-on-one matchups, Kinlaw has struggled to identify play-action passes and quickly convert from defending the run to getting after the quarterback. Again, the only difference is I pointed this out before he was even drafted. Nick Reiner's pointing it out today. So again, why me? Why would you retweet me? Why would I be your biggest inspiration? Maybe because I point out before it would happen instead of after it happened. But that's why everyone follows me because I predict stuff before it happens. And I say two two steps ahead. Which is why when Richard Sherman, let's talk about recent news. Richard Sherman said on record that he may not return or doesn't think he'll return to San Francisco because they have so many free agents they have to resign. Yeah, take a look at Fred Warner. He said, specifically Fred Warner, 16 to 18 million. What did I say in my podcast, which I included in the description below? There's three podcasts on that, on Fred Warner. Yes, I am tied to Fred Warner and his future contract and the number that he would command on the open market in a front-loaded deal if he were to be traded or retained by San Francisco. It's a front-loaded deal. Again, that's in this earlier podcast, but it's a front-loaded deal. I'm just going to touch base on it. He's $34 million already overdue, outplaying his rookie contract in the last two years of his deal. And Bobby Wagner gets paid $18 million. Fred Warner gets paid less than $1 million. You do the math, that's $17 million per year. 17 times 2 is $34 million. So that's already overdue in a front-loaded deal. And then you command the top middle linebacker in the NFL. Money, you're talking about a salary annually of around 18 to 20 million per year which leaves Sherman on the outside looking in and again here's another podcast that I put out last year or this offseason excuse me on why the team should have released Richard Sherman saved 12.9 million dollars they could have used that money to retain DeForest Buckner who was already playing on the fifth year contract and at the time fans were saying oh man no that's dumb you know we don't we, we need Richard Sherman And I said, no, he is not the same player. We saw it in the Super Bowl. I saw it all year leading up to the Super Bowl. The Chiefs recognized it. They just got hit with a better offensive coordinator in Andy Reid, who kind of schemed up and played to his player's strengths while exposing the secondary's weakness. That guy was Sherman. He was rarely tested all year, but when he was tested, he got beat deep. The only problem was those completions weren't those completions. Those passes weren't being completed early on in the year, but the wide receivers were getting open when Cush, uh, when Sherman plays with a 5-7 yard cushion, and he was beat on double moves. Andy Reid exposed it in the Super Bowl. Ultimately, it was a big play by Sammy Watkins. We all know how the rest of the game ended. Hurts to say it, but oh gosh, I that game, man. The Niners should have won that game. Anyways, I'm getting heated. Okay, but getting back to Javon Kinlaw, all right? He also said in that tweet, he's going to show me who he is. That's fine. I mean, I I think it's, again, this is not throwing shade at Javon Kinlaw. I believe he's a Pro Bowl player. But why do you have the need to kind of show me who he is? I already know who you are, Javon Kinlaw. You're a proverbial boom 
prospect where you can be a Pro Bowl player. I even said you could be a Pro Bowl player, which is why people who followed me said, why is he salty? In fact, one of my followers, or a few of my followers, let me just go back in here, says, why is he salty? You're calling him a Pro Bowl player. Yeah, it makes no sense. Everyone knows about my Twitter exchange with Eric Armstead or the personal text that he made on me, and does he have some kind of role in that? I don't know. I'm not going to assume anything. People are asking me, but... Javon Killen has no idea who I am, or he does, obviously, because he wouldn't be tweeting me, but I don't even cover the San Francisco 49ers as a beat writer anymore. I left the San Francisco 49ers back in 2018, and I left on my own. So when Eric Arnstead put, oh, you got your credentials revoked? No, I left on my own to pursue and further my career, which is covering the Pittsburgh Steelers, and then now all 32 NFL teams. So, with that being said, no, I never got my credentials revoked. People were asking me and thinking that. No, that's not true. You can check with the 49ers yourselves. Check the Twitter receipts. I put it out there. No, I left on my own. And another reason was that I was working at 49ers Fit. Al Guido, the president of the San Francisco 49ers, called it my Super Bowl. And when they did the ribbon-cutting ceremony, I was the only beat writer that showed up that covered that event. And then later was working for 49ers Fit to help open up that club. And the rest was history. It mattered a lot of 49ers fans, and they deemed it as a conflict of interest when I was now an employee of the 49ers and now a 49ers beat writer because of my style of writing, which is fine. Um, but I had to pick and choose. And at the time, I was like, okay, well, I'm trying to grow 49ers Fit. You know, it's a great gym for those who don't check it out. Check out that gym. And then it was the beat writing and I just thought you know I did the beat writing for seven years now um, five years on the beat and I said you know what let's just try 49ers fit since I'm known for my fitness anyways again for those who don't know I compete in the bodybuilding industry I'm actually going for my pro card right now nationally qualified to turn pro um, won a few shows and in Sacramento college boy and um, yeah so that that's where we stand right now all right so no I didn't get my credentials revoked. Just putting that out there. Okay. But getting back to Javon Kinlaw. He's going to show me who he is. That's fine. I think he should be self-motivated. Constructive criticism happens in the NFL. And let me tell you something. The Bay Area media is not as hard as the ones back east like New York, Philadelphia. Those guys are even 10 times harder. So if you can't take constructive criticism in the NFL, or if you are upset, forget constructive criticism. If you don't respect me, that's fine. But if you don't even have thick, thick enough skin to even silence the doubters, which in my case, I would be considered your doubter at this point, at this stage in your career, and just let your play do the talking, that just adds fuel to the fire. Like, that's good that you're motivated by it, and I, I like how you're motivated by it, but at the end of the day, you should be more motivated by getting your wins down in the trenches. And then I have something good to write about. Why does he have the need to prove to me anything? He plays well, he gets praise. He plays bad, he gets criticism. Our job is to project and predict. His job is to perform. It's like a former coach told me. If players don't like it, play better. That's what I tell them. That's what he said. All right? What we say or don't say has no impact for his on-field production. You know, focus on the task at hand, not the media. That's just some rookie advice for Javon Kinlaw. And again, he deleted the tweet, so I'm sure he kind of wishes he didn't tweet that. Or if he did, I don't know what he's thinking. But he deleted it for a reason. And luckily, I screenshotted it and I put it up there because, again, it wasn't a shot at Javon Kinlaw, so don't get it twisted. Again, I believe Javon Kinlaw has probable potential, but at this stage of his career, he's not getting it done. And I'm not saying not getting it done at a Pro Bowl level. I'm saying not getting it done even for a rookie. All right? Now, coming into this draft, and again, you can check my Twitter receipts, I didn't believe any defensive tackle was worthy of a top 15 pick. I just didn't see it. Even That includes even Derek Brown. So, when I called him a reach in the earlier in the podcast uh, below, which I included connecting the dots to this podcast, you guys can read that. I call it how I see it. And calling him a reach at 15 or 14 or as a top 15 pick, it's not necessarily throwing shade at Javon Kinlaw. 
It's just my perspective on the situation. And as it turns out, if you were to redo the draft, would you take Javon Kinlaw at 14th overall? Or even 13th overall? 14th overall? Or would you rather have CeeDee Lamb? Would you rather the team trade down and get Justin Jefferson, which I pointed out in an earlier podcast in my pre-draft and analytics that told me that Justin Jefferson would be a stud in Kyle Shanahan's offense. Again, calling it how I see it. Am I right more times than not? Absolutely. But am I right all the time? No, because if I was, I'd be God and no one is God. All right. So getting back to Javon Kinlaw, you know, you're a rookie, but you know, you also say things like slowly but surely it's going to be a marathon, not a sprint and you'll get better. You know, well, that, that's great. You know, and I agree with you. NFL stands for not for long, right? Yeah, you're a rookie, but gap integrity, resetting the edge, anchoring the point of attack, these are fundamentals that you should be knowing already how to instill. It should be ingrained in your DNA at this point in this stage of your career. And when you look at rookies, I'm not going to compare them to DeVorce Buckner. That's unfair. Let's compare them to other rookies. Like Raekwon Davis, which I included in an earlier podcast in the description below. Watch those podcasts, guys, and connect the dots. You guys stay tuned to what I'm talking about. Raekwon Davis is playing at a Pro Bowl level in my grading system. And since he has been entrenched as the starting nose tackle, his natural position from Alabama, where he started his career with the Miami Dolphins at defensive end at 3-4 base, got his opportunity kicking inside to nose tackle, taking on multiple double teams on a consistent basis. He's still generating pressure up front and doing it seamlessly and that's what Raekwon Davis did at Alabama and that's why they were so good. Raekwon Davis to me and again if you check my Twitter receipts I had him going number 55 overall to the Baltimore Ravens I believe and again this is all pre-draft selections. I do this before the draft. I make my list of the top prospects and then where I think they might go based on my analytics. I had him going number 55 he went number 56, one pick later, to the Miami Dolphins, all right? Not throwing shade, but just putting his play, as in Kinlaw, in perspective to other rookies around the NFL. Now, Javon Kinlaw is a stout run defender. I mean, he is good when he's on his game. He is excellent when he's on his game. He has a mean pull, uh, bull rush. He has violent hands. He is a hand fighter. He is a phone booth type of guy. He's a guy that I can see getting five to eight sacks next year. And that's high praise coming from me because, again, when I say things that are good or bad regarding your team, 49ers, Steelers, whoever the team I'm talking about, I always keep it real. I always stay, uh, keep it 100. And with Javon Kinlaw, I believe he's going to be a stud next year. You know, year two is usually where the guy shines. Rookie year, you kind of get acclimated to the offense or the defense, respectively. But once you start hitting your stride in year two, you're not thinking so much about how to play and leverage your technique. You're more reacting to the play itself. So instead of a re and react style play, you're just reacting. All right. Because everything comes naturally. You have a year under your belt. You have snaps played under your belt. You know what kind of schemes you're going up against now that you play against NFC West teams twice a year. So that's already six games out of your schedule where you can kind of have a better feel of how your opponent's going to be matching up against you. Things of that nature. So Yes, Javon Kinlaw's going to be a stud next year. He's a stud this year for a rookie, but he does have some growing pains, and fundamentals is one of the things that I'm really concerned about. But that's going to come with time. That's going to come with another year of training because there was no proper offseason. But again, Raekwon Davis didn't have a proper offseason, and he's still leveraging his technique well. So you can't really use that as an excuse. Every NFL team's on the same level playing field due to COVID-19. All right? With that said, let's go ahead and talk about GM John Lynch. Because if we're going to blame someone, blame John Lynch. He's the one that's making these moves, right? He said they ain't build Roman one year, right? Or sorry, not not John Lynch. But the later half of that tweet that Kinlaw says, he said they ain't build Roman one year. That's true, Javon. And again, you have Pro Bowl potential. I really like what you have to offer. But other beat writers... In the media or in NFL media are saying the same exact thing that I'm saying. So I wonder if you think or you're saving the bookmarking their information too because they're the ones actually covering you on a full time basis, right? He says, people, you know, let me just get back to it. I'm scrolling here so I can kind of see what John Lynch said about Javon Kinlaw in his post draft presser to the media. 
And again, I think people were buying into GM John Lynch's Kool-Aid. He said, he's the guy we had zero down on for a while. When you first built this thing, Kyle, Kyle and I came together. One of the things that we really believed in was that was an equalizer. In a football league where everything is set up for the offense to be successful, one of the ways you can equalize the equation is get after it and knock down the passer. We built a pretty good unit there with DeForest Buckner, who's now gone, and we wanted to keep that strong with Buckner gone and felt he was a great fit for that. So he had, he openly admitted he needed a pass rusher, stated that Javon Kimmel was a perfect fit for that, although I only saw a bull rusher at the time. And because you trade DeForest Buckner off to the Indianapolis Colts, you had the need to fill that need in the draft. And then you draft Javon Kinlaw, who in reality you could have had and went after what I said in the scenario and drafted CeeDee Lamb. Or it even traded down to get Justin Jefferson. And then at 31, people are asking me, well, what, what did they do at 31 then? We drafted Brandon Ayuk. What would you do at 31 if you went wide receiver at number 14? Easy. If you check my Twitter receipts, I said they should have got Raekwon Davis because... As you know, DJ Jones is an unrestricted free agent. Is he going to return next year? No. And you're going to need a two-down run stuffer. Who would be that guy? Who's that guy on that roster right now? You don't have one. So you have to go in the draft. Why not do what I just said and draft CeeDee Lamb, the best player available, at number 14, or trade down and get Justin Jefferson. And then at 31, go get Justin Matabuki or Raekwon Davis. That's what I would have did. And again, this is not a jab at Javon Kinlaw because I can see why John Lynch drafted Javon Kinlaw because they liked his potential. They saw flashes of his Pro Bowl potential and I see it. But for me, if I'm going to draft a player at number at the top 15th pick, I want to make sure that that player is going to be good from the get-go, especially if my Super Bowl window is now. The Super Bowl window is now. They're coming off a Super Bowl loss. So which means in the NFL, that window is two to three years. If you wanted to keep that window open longer, you should have extended DeForest Buckner, got rid of Richard Sherman and his $12.9 million contract, wiped your hands clean of there, not resign Eric Arnstead, which is owed about $6 million. That's around $19 million. You can give Buckner an extra year to kind of rework that deal in a long-term deal because he was playing on the fifth-year option, signed him to a long-term deal, and then reworked it the following year to, so it can fit in the budget. But I don't see how... You can justify saying that you wanted to keep that unit strong and we felt he was a great fit for that, John Lynch, when everyone, not just me, but everyone else was saying that was the knock on Javon Kinla was he showed flashes of interior rushing presence, but he only had a strong bull rush with violent hands. Now, again, this is not a knock on Javon Kinla. I mean, can I do it? No, I'm not in the NFL. I'm not a professional player. So... When people say, or like Eric Arnold said, oh, well, what credentials do you have to say what you're saying? Well, check my Twitter receipts. Check my YouTube receipts. I'm spot on in my analysis, which is why people follow me. That's where I get my credibility from. And Javon Kinlaw, to me, is a boom prospect. He Again, this is not hating on Javon Kinla. I think he's going to be a great player. And it was unfair to put this kind of due pressure on Javon Kinla replacing DeForest Buckner. That was just an unfair situation for Javon Kinla to come into. But at the end of the day, the 49ers were also baking on Eric Armstead, who's getting paid $85 million to be that guy to step up. Regardless of Nick Bosa and DeFord, regardless if they're out or not, you're getting paid $85 million to be that guy. Regardless who's surrounded by you're the foundational player. So when he's not living up to the, his expectations or his contract, and then you have Javon Kinlaw, who's kind of trying to learn from guys like Eric Armstead, who's a team captain, and then you have other guys that have to step up, like Kerry Hyder Jr., he came out of nowhere, and Kevin Givens, and players like that, Jordan Willis, who you pick up off the street and has just as many sacks as Eric Armstead, one and a half, and played only half the season for San Francisco, or not even that. What does that tell you about the team moving forward? It's in shambles. And even when you get Nick Bosa back, you're not going to have D Ford. He's all but gone. He's all but gone. You don't even know if he's going to return because of his career-threatening injury, right? You know, neck, back injury, whatever the case may be. He is damaged goods at this point. So literally what you're looking at is Nick Bosa, Eric Armstead, Javon Kinlaw, 
And whoever the fourth guy could be, it's not going to be Kerry Hyder Jr. because he's going to get paid this offseason and they don't have enough money to go around. Surely Richard Sherman would be a higher priority than Kerry Hyder Jr. if they were to play an apples to apples comparison on it. And at this point, it's really up to those guys, Bosa, Armstead, and Kinlaw, to get the job done. Now, Bosa is going to make everyone better. We've seen it last year in his rookie year. He was a defensive player of the year candidate for a reason. He alone commands double teams, especially in max protect. He really changes up the scheme. That's going to open up things for Javon Kinlaw up the middle and Eric Armstead on the edges. And when he kick inside, he'll get freed up one-on-one. Ultimately, it will be up to those guys to go ahead and generate pressure. And look for that to happen with Javon Kinlaw. Again, I see a Pro Bowl player. I don't see anyone else putting that out there that he's a Pro Bowl player. I'm putting it out that he has Pro Bowl potential and that he potentially can be a Pro Bowl player. And next year, he will put up at least at least five to nine sacks next year. That's right. Five to nine sacks from one and a half. That's going to be a huge jump and huge spike in his production. And then people are going to be talking about how great Javon Kinla is. Watch. You'll see. Well, that'll be it for today. I hope you liked what I had to offer. If you did, please hit the subscribe button in the lower right-hand corner of your screen as I keep all things beast. Thank you for tuning in. Have a good night. Beast Rider, out.